Do you know how it feels when you play one of the most beautiful games you've ever played, and then see other games distance themselves from that style? My early childhood consisted of Super Nintendo games, which were all beautiful, but they were also showing their age compared to this new PlayStation we had. Oh yeah, and there was also the Nintendo 64. I mean, I thought it looked incredible, but it was a different kind of beautiful. Hindsight says it was an ugly beautiful. Outside of Yoshi's Story, Mischief Makers, and some puzzle games, I knew the Nintendo 64 as a 3D powerhouse. But the PlayStation was more varied, and while it did have its fair share of 3D titles that I adored and thought were the peak of visuals, it also did have games that looked like very, very enhanced Super Nintendo titles. Titles like Suikoden, Alundra, and this video subject, Breath of Fire 3. These showed me video games that had mastered their visuals, but this was already on its way out at this stage, as 3D was coming to dominate whether I liked it or not. Okay, this is very revisionist. I love 3D titles too, and 4 year old me wouldn't have been able to construct thoughts like this. But while I didn't even mind or notice industry style trends at the time, this became more apparent as I grew older and saw there was a neglected spot for games of this art style, especially 32-bit 2D RPGs. It became much worse as the years progressed, and 8 and 16-bit took over retro gaming discourse. They're all good, but where's my Wild Arms love? The PlayStation is one of the most transitionary and varied consoles in history. I adore it. But if I had to pick a favorite game on that system, I'd go for Ape Escape. But if I had to pick again, Spyro 3. But if you kept asking me until I used every platformer I'd put at the top of the list, I mean, I guess Breath of Fire 3. That game's still a masterpiece, after all. That being said, for the sake of keeping my portable gaming desires in check, I am specifically looking at the PSP version. This is basically the same game, except it's in widescreen. There is a slight smoothing effect, there are very slight sprite changes like Stallion being brown, and if you play this on a physical UMD, it does have longer load times than the PS1 release. The gameplay is basically unchanged. The sprites are still the same, and while I'm not normally a fan of smoothing effects, it's subtle enough here and mitigates the lack of CRT scan lines, so I am more than comfortable with it. We also have easier access to the fishing minigame in this release, and if that was probably the main reason you played the game anyway, I mean, why else would it be on the title screen? I have a soft spot for this, because I believe it was the first game I ever played that had a fishing minigame. This is what I think of first, sorry Ocarina of Time. Plus, one advantage of the PSP release is it can join the very small list of PAL getting a game and the American markets being screwed over. Plus, the PAL PS1 release has one of the ugliest covers of the era, and we got a nice one a decade later with this re-release. You could play either version of the game, they're both great. The Breath of Fire series is best known today as those weird SNES RPGs on Nintendo Switch Online. They are also good games with excellent visuals, but 3 was the series entry to CDs, and it was my personal first title in the series. It is such a wonderful outing. The series continued with one more PlayStation 1 title, a PlayStation 2 title, and then nothing. Well, there is a discontinued mobile game, only in Japan, that's calling itself Breath of Fire 6. It just means when we get a new one, it has to be called Breath of Fire Mania. These games usually star a blue-haired guy called Ryu by default, or Freeze if you're me. These are self-contained titles with shared themes and character names, kind of like the Zelda games before the confusing timeline was established. Some of these games, namely the first three, are likely to be in the same world and you could piece together some kind of timeline if you wanted to, but it's not exactly official and it's not something that is required for enjoyment. In this third game, we start off as a little dragon in these crystals. We'll later learn they're called Chrism. We're freed and we brutally murder everyone in this mine until we're dealt with and sent away. But thanks to the power of mashing the D-pad, we fall off this track and exit our cage, but we transform into a blue-haired kid. We're asleep at the time, but we're found by a furry thief and taken in by him since he doesn't want to leave a naked kid stranded out in the open world full of monsters. So, with our new friends Ray the furry thief, 
and Tebow, the other kid that he also adopted, we start making a living in this world until we're forcefully evicted and on the run from gangsters who not only want to murder us, they basically did. We only survived thanks to our dragon powers making us much more resilient than regular humans. Plus I kept grinding, other people don't know if you kill slimes for 15 hours you get really strong. After surviving a murder attempt, our boy with blue hair and pronouns is separated from his friends and discovers much of a world we're a part of, and I genuinely love this world. In addition to humans, and furry humans, and murderous horse people, we also have fish people, monkey people, frog people, and even a judicial system that punishes the corrupt. It is a fun fantasy setting that doesn't stick to the simplest of cliches. This is fervid with details like the technological junk everywhere, and the history of dragons which this game is not afraid to explain. Plus we can even get vaccines which is really cool but some might find the game too political for it. This is a world where people are using magical crystals and technology to speed up agriculture, and it leads to a sentient onion mutant who joins your party. That's not even as exciting as having Naruto with a tail buddy with you. We also have a girl boss with a bazooka, and this cool looking guy called Gar, who as a kid I thought was either a woman or a very feminine but buff guy. I thought he had a dress and necklace and painted nails, so I thought he might have just been a bit like that. I was a kid, I wasn't the smartest. All the party members are excellent characters, even if stat-wise they're not all made equally. But this game does force them all onto you on occasion, and while that does stifle creativity, it does alleviate the issue of having a core group and everyone else rotting in the Dragon Quest party wagon. Creativity is still in full force in the game as we can give each member a master who changes their stat allocation. There are more practical uses, like oh maybe I'll give the one that boosts magic or AP to the characters who primarily use magic, but you can assign these to whoever you wish and get some more unexpected combos. Maybe you'd rather the protagonist be more into magic, or maybe you'd rather boost his health and defense, or maybe you'd rather he get better agility and accuracy. This does mean there's more to do on replays, even if this isn't as robust as a full class system. Outside of combat, each character is cycled through a chosen party of three, and you can switch the lead character and perform a special action, like firing the bazooka at a weak wall, or lockpicking, or doing this cute onion nudge thing. This makes each character feel useful, even if it does mean you sometimes have to leave the dungeon you're in and come back if a character can open the way forward. Inside of combat, like I said, you will learn some characters are better than others, but no one is completely useless or a fun ruiner. Everyone serves their purpose, but they all do take a backseat to our protagonist, who not only has physical attacks and spells like every other JRPG character out there, but they can also use their dragon genes to transform into a dragon during a battle. You can mix and match these dragon genes to create a dragon that is more useful for that specific encounter, but usually the more powerful they are, the more AP they use per turn. You can stack these together though, so you could be using 3 dragons worth of AP every single turn if you want to go all out. This is a fun risk reward, and it does help you feel creative as you come up with new combinations. But you do generally want to balance power and the conservation of your resources as something a bit weaker will last much longer and not leave you as vulnerable at the end of a battle. By the end of the game, you'll be going Super Saiyan and balancing even more AP use while also potentially being unable to control yourself, but hey, that's just the perk of being really strong. This dragon usage is the main standout feature in the combat of this game, but I'm not really playing for that. Otherwise, the combat is fairly standard and not particularly balanced either. The only other outliers are the extra turns characters get if they have fast enough agility, which isn't unique to this title, but it's also not the most widespread mechanic either. And you can even examine enemies to learn new skills, which is cool, but not the most important part of the game and could be skipped out entirely, which means it's less important than fishing, which is mandatory and takes up more of the manual than transforming into a dragon does. The best feature in battling is seeing our little guy with soft serve ice cream looking hair and his animations. At the start of the game he attacks without any confidence, but throughout the game he matures and feels more confident in his swordsmanship, and becomes a great swordsman. Emphasis on the man part of that, because he ages up thanks to a mid-game time skip. 
This was the first game I had ever seen do something like this, and while I know it's certainly not the first one, it is sentimental to me, and I feel like it's one of the more standout examples of this. The time skip is wonderfully executed. The build-up, the reveals, and the aftermath are all great, and recontextualize a lot of the experiences we went through thus far. Throughout the game, the enemies will scale up from slimes to thick rocks and far beyond, and it does have its copious amounts of reskinning, but I can't be that upset when the sprite work looks this good. This game is full of character, including anime sweat bubbles and text bouncing around for effect. We have fun idol animations, and when everyone rests at camp, they do it in a fitting way for their characters. Camping is a whole mechanic that eases a lot of tension in this game. At most points in the open world, we can set up camp and restore health, save the game, and switch out our party members. This is a wonderful quality of life issue, meaning you're never too far away from a place to recover, and it also means as a portable version of the game, we can always just save and quit at any point. Camping is not a solution to everything, however, as if a character faints during combat and they are not revived in that same combat encounter, they will come back with lower max HP. You'll have to go to an inn and pay the money to rest and get their HP back up to what it should be. While we're on the world map, we move very quickly and have no random encounters. This is a safe place just to traverse the map, and we get to go to locations of our choosing. Battles only happen in dungeons and specified locations, or in these entirely optional fields that you can just grind in if you need to. There is no point in which you'll need to have battles if you're just traveling from town to town in the open world. If you see your party of three and it's not a town, expect random encounters, and if you're chippy and alone, it is entirely safe. These different perspectives do wonders for the sense of scale here. A lot of games in the genre with open worlds are obviously not one-to-one -one representations of the size of a world. We know our hero isn't as tall as a mountain or take up the size of a town, and it's evidenced by the fact that these locations can sometimes let us explore. But here, practically every single tile can be explored if you so choose, and we can see just how massive the world actually is. It feels massive, even if it actually isn't in terms of playable space. It's big enough to feel like a giant world for our characters, while not feeling too giant for us for players. We get a large, seemingly limitless world, but the convenience of it being small and free of annoying obstacles. Later in the game we even cross an ocean that no one has ever successfully done, and sure, it's automated and a scripted affair, but the scope isn't lost. Having a full map of this place would lose its mysteriousness. Here, no two areas feel the same, and it truly feels like this is a setting that hasn't been explored or fully settled yet. Oh, and apparently it is a requirement I mentioned the desert here. This does truly make the game feel giant. I love it. To me, it is a highlight of the game, but I don't want to focus on it because a lot of people seem to hate this section. And even if YouTube has removed the dislikes, it doesn't mean people can't break into my home and kill me for my opinions of the desert being great. We start off in perhaps the most generic area of the game, but that just serves to defy our expectations later. We are seen as country bumpkins by some after all. There are cities here and locales have different architecture and culture, without ever going down the Dragon Quest route of, aren't accents funny? Although this game isn't above that, thanks to the one fourth wall break here, where we're asked if we need an English translation after speaking to someone who only speaks Australian. Other than that, the locales here don't feel like direct ports of existing ones. They do have their obvious influences, but while that may be the case for the humans and other humanoids here, the world presents a fascinating backstory that we only get glimpses at. The history of this world is a big driving factor of why I love the back half of the game so much, even if the gameplay of it does have its issues. We see a lot of robots and computers from what is now described as the Techno Age, and it paints a very broad picture, but one that's always just out of reach and wanting us leaving more. The story has lulls, and the worst of it is in that mid to late point, but the lore did keep me hooked. Once we leave the introduction area, we're basically always trying to find someone or something. We're always on the move to get answers, which is surprisingly intriguing and well done, even if the idea of finding places doesn't sound particularly interesting. Regardless, the fun world and the encounters we have with these people, in addition to the story that unfolds very slowly, kept me enthralled throughout. 
but we later find ourselves needing to do countless small but tedious tasks just to progress. The actual goal isn't changing, it's just being halted. We have to work harder to get a boat here than any other game I've seen. And even after we get the boat, it won't work without scouring the world for pieces, which then gets us into the immediate water but not our actual goal of going out to the ocean, which requires us to find a specific person. And then once we find that specific person, we have to cook food for him. And of course, this requires that we get all these ingredients for food, which could have been obtained earlier, but for the non-psychic first players out there, this means backtracking to the other end of the map. And even after we get all those pieces, we then have to cook it ourselves through a minigame. This game loves its minigames, but I don't love all of them. This is honestly where my enjoyment for the game hit its absolute lowest, but I was still very intrigued, and even though I didn't enjoy the constant interruptions, I kept going through it. There's not really a big gameplay difference between traveling somewhere because we want to, and traveling somewhere because we're told to do something before we can get on with what we were trying to do in the first place. But these intrusions towards the back half do go from edging us to just stopping any fun climax anytime soon. But worst of all, some of these sections not only were terrible minigames, but minigames that could be a massive barrier to different people. Strict button mashing isn't fun for me, and I'm able-bodied and still in my 20s. I hate to imagine someone being stuck this late in the game because they physically can't do it. There are sections here that require you react to audio, which is not only an issue for people with hearing difficulties, but some of us play without sounds, like me playing the PSP at midnight next to my sleeping partner because I don't want to disturb them with sound, I just want to disturb them with my bright screen. But even though I did it for like half the game, I would not recommend playing this on mute if you can help it. Breath of Fire 3 has one of the greatest soundtracks out there. Every single song is a bop, and I've honestly spent more time listening to the game's soundtrack in YouTube alone, in the background while I'm doing other things, than I've spent actually playing the game, and I've beat this game more than once, which is code for two. So that does mean something. I don't want to criticize gaming journalists too much, everyone is entitled to their opinions if it's not harming anyone, so I won't act out the retribution I secretly believe people deserve if they say the music wasn't good. I do not know how anyone could say this soundtrack veers widely from unmemorable electronica to hopeless smolts. It pains me to see someone say that this music, which is among the best of its genre, was more appropriate for a corporate infomercial than a fantasy RPG. Oh wait, the person who said that was Nob Ogasawara, and I owe him a lot for his contributions to my childhood and jaded adulthood. I don't want to criticize him too much, I'll just be a bit sad inside instead. The battle themes of this game are all intense. The dungeon music, atmospheric, everything fits perfectly, whether it be jovial or melancholic. Breath of Fire 3 is not a flawless game. If it was, it would be called Lufia 2. But in terms of artistic expression, it's beyond most of its contemporaries and still a shining beacon by today's standards. The sprite work is phenomenal, music equally as great, every character is well written, and the story constantly delivers even if there are some intrusions that do lower the experience. The only real issue I have with the game is the constant pace-breaking intrusions and in some of the minigames late game, but they happen long enough into this game that you'll already be hooked in, and close enough to the end that you wouldn't want to give up since you're almost there. I mean, if people liked Wind Waker for all these years, then an annoying section near the end shouldn't stop anyone from one of the greatest games on the PlayStation 1. Play Breath of Fire 3 if you have any interest in this genre, this is one of the best games you could find and then play the rest of the series until Capcom realizes we want more. This is one of my favorite games of all time, and a true highlight for both systems fortunate enough to have it. 